This morning, I want to minister to you about uh, Jesus the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13, 8. What a powerful, powerful promise. And this is a promise of God's word. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Are you glad that Jesus never changes? Amen. He never changes. You know, every morning when I wake up, I think about what this day is going to bring. What is this day going to bring? Because we live in a forever changing world. This is a forever changing world. It's like people you knew yesterday can change today. How many know what I'm talking about? Yesterday they were one way, today they are another way. And I can tell you that if, if I had a dime for every promise made to me uh, from man, amen, I always say I would be a multi-billionaire in the last 50 years of ministry. So many words have fallen down. Have fallen down. This is the the world that we live in today. We live today in a in a forever changing world, a, a world that is filled with with fear and uncertainties. Uh, uh, something that we we see everywhere around the earth, and there's a tremendous uh, tremendous amount of anxiety that that is based upon not having control, not having control, not being sure of things. Right now, this is where we are. You know, people are filled with fear because they feel so uncertain about the future. They feel so insecure because there is so much that is being told to them. And yet, having the, 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 the knowledge and knowing that, that things can change at any moment, whether, whether it's uh, economically or, or even spiritually, you, you know, things are, are changing constantly. And, and it's a real blessing when we look at the scriptures. You know, th this, this word came to me. I was in the office here uh, the other day with my secretary, and, and Emily was also there, our, our uh, uh person that does all the all the uh, uh, designs for the church in publication and she's a great blessing and both of them are but I was in the office and we were talking and we were talking precisely about this subject I didn't even know what I was going to preach on and suddenly the Holy Spirit brings this passage of scripture to my heart and I quote it and suddenly just like the presence of God was in that office because we were talking about the, the uncertainties that are in the world today. And what a comforting, comf comforting feeling is to know, amen, as Christians, that we're not in this world just hoping that something would happen. We know who's in charge and we know who's in control, amen. And his name is Jesus and he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we ought to give him a praise, amen. Because he is faithful. Listen, anything can change in this world. Anything can change. But we know the scriptures show us and teach us that there is a sure foundation upon which we can build with great faith. With great faith. Jesus is not just the same yesterday, today, and forever, but his love is also everlasting. His love is everlasting. Plain English. His love is forever. Because he is forever. And because his word is forever. Numbers 23 verse 19 tell us this. God is not man that he should lie. He is not man that he should lie. Or a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said and will he not do it? Or has he spoken and will, will he not fulfill it? And so we find, you know, the Bible tells us that Jesus, the same yesterday, today, and forever, it, it means that his truth is infallible. That whatever he says, not only does he mean it, but it's also eternal. It is eternal. It is infinite. It is omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent. And also his love. 
His love for us, His love for you, that is forever to the glory of God. Can I get an amen this morning? Listen to the words of Jesus, Matthew 24, 12. He says, and because lawlessness, and because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. And this means that there will be less love in the world. There will be less love in the world and more fear. There will be more hypocrisy and less loyalty, less love uh, for God and less love for one another. The kind of society that, that we are living today. In other words, when people practice lawlessness, then they become less loving. Because lawlessness, sin, takes over. And this is why we have the condition that we have today where there is so much hate and so much tension. The rage, you know, and, and the other day I was talking about the role rage. Well, the role rage is in the church too. It's in the church with people because, you know, when the love of God is missing, there, 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 there are no compassions, there are no mercies. Everything that God means about his love suddenly runs dry. And the only thing that we have uh, is our, our eyes for one another and, and depending whether we like that person or we don't like that person or whatever. And this is why we have the condition that we have in the streets today. When people are in loving, when they're not loving one another, then it's almost like one person gets offended and hates the person because that person hurt them or they let them down. They don't forgive and they don't have mercy and they, they, they don't want to let go certain uh, hurts. And that's because when love is missing, in, then there is hate. And then there is, there, there, there is separation. Even among Christians I see the, this. So often where love should reign. And if there's one thing that should reign in the church is the love of God. You see what makes you different from that guy in the world is that you're supposed to have the love of Jesus in you. You're supposed to have the love of God. That makes no exceptions of people. Amen. Amen. Regardless of who they are. As a matter of fact, you know, when we think of Christmas, uh, we ought to think about God's love. For the Bible says he so loved the world that he gave Jesus, amen, to come into this world to die for our sins. That's how much he loved you. And that is the love that really should rule in the hearts of believers. Thank God that the word of God teaches us, amen, that even though there will be a shortage of love, in the last days in this world, Jesus' love will always be the same. It will never stop loving people. Now let's get a little biblical here and see a picture of what is the love of Jesus. Ephesians 5.25, speaking of marriage and speaking of a man and a woman, says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. That he might sanctify, cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. That he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. But that she should be holy and without blemish. So here the apostle Paul gives us a great picture of what the love of God really is for us. He not only starts us out in life, not only does he save you, but the promise is that he takes care of you. That he watches over you. Amen. That's the greatness of God's love. What is the difference between the love of the world and the love of God? Is that he watches over you every single day of your life, every single moment, because he's got a purpose and a plan and a great destination for your life. Amen. Not only to get you started, but also to get you there. And he loves you all the way, even to the point that he is willing to die for the church. And that he died for the church and then he was raised on the third day, amen, and still ministers to the church. And I hope that we're catching this this morning because this is the kind of love that God wants in the church. 
It is an everlasting love. A love that never gives up. No matter how many disappointments we may experience. It never gives up. It is consistent. It is always there. Verse 27, that he might present her, notice, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Meaning, hallelujah, that not only is he going to love you, he's going to supply everything necessary for you to make it. And for you to be strong. And for you to succeed in this life until that day when Jesus calls us home. Can I get an amen? amen? And we're talking about Jesus the same yesterday, today, and forever. See, God will love you to the end. Here's another picture where Jesus speaks about his love. Matthew 5, 43 through verse 48. He says, you have heard that it was said. You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Notice. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he makes his son rise, meaning the son, not the son of God, but the son that shines over us. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust, making no exception of people. He makes no difference from one person to another who he will bless. But he shines over the whole world. He shines over every person in this world. That's how great and magnificent is the love of God. And then it goes on to say, so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore, notice, you therefore, speaking to us, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. And perfection there is referring to the love of God, which is a perfect love. Amen. See, you will never find imperfection in God's love. You won't find flaws in God's love. No matter how hard you treat it, no matter how harsh life may be or how people may react, it doesn't matter. God's love can never be bent. It can never be wasted. It just won't go away. Are you thankful for that this morning? And that is because his love is perfect. So here Jesus is, is saying, you know, perfect love, that, that is worthy of our imitation. That's the kind of love that God wants the church to have. That's the kind of love that should, that should reign in our lives. Amen. A love that is not prejudice. A love that makes no exception. Amen. Of people. Of color. Of nationality. Of language. Amen. Can you imagine Jesus going to the cross. And looking down on the world. And saying well I'm only here for a certain a certain kind of people. But that is not the fact. The Bible says that he died for all. He died for every soul. He died for every person. Amen. Whether we like them or not. Hallelujah. How many know what I'm talking about? Just because we don't like a person, it doesn't mean that God doesn't love them. And it is that kind of love that makes people lovely. That makes people accept it because they come with the love of God. This love. Ephesians 5, 2 says, Therefore be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also have loved us and given himself for us an offering, a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma. So the reason why God's love is unchanging is because his love is simply perfect 
it changes not. See, if God loved you yesterday, he will love you today. If he, if he loved you so much yesterday, he will love you. And matter of fact, he will love you even more. And he will love you tomorrow. No matter what goes on around your life. Amen. He will love you regardless. I love Romans 3, uh, Romans 8, 35, 39, where it says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword. And then it goes on to say, as it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I think we ought to bless the Lord this morning. Amen. That's the love of God. That is how much God loves you. He loves you so much that he cares about you and he cares where you are today or wherever you may be tomorrow. But let's go on and see that just as Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, in his love, so is his word. So is his word. And let me tell you, God's word is everlasting. In other words, it is Forever, And when you think forever finished, it begins again. Somebody said eternity is here, and then it goes on some more. And more and more. And there's no end to eternity. That's the power of the word of the Lord, the word of God. That is why God blesses us when we place our faith on the word and we stand on the word. That even though we pray for things, amen, they don't come to pass. But why do we keep praying? Because we know his word is truth. Because we know that his word will never fail us. Matthew 24, 35 says, heaven and earth shall pass away. But my words will not pass away. So you see, whatever Jesus said 2,000 years ago when he was on the earth. Whatever he said, whatever he did and spoke his word. 2,000 years ago is the same word that we can speak today and the same way that it came through 2,000 years ago it will also come to pass today because it is the same word nothing changes the word of God time doesn't change the word of God trials doesn't change the word of God tribulations doesn't change the world the, the word of God. Amen. This world cannot change the word of the Lord. Because the word of the Lord is forever and ever and ever. Can we get an amen this morning? <laughs> Healing. God is a miracle working God. The healing of his word. The Bible says that he sent his word. And he healed them. The same word that performed miracles in the past. The same words that Jesus spoke during his earthly ministry. The same words that the early church uh, preached and spoke uh, in the early days of the church. Uh, even though it's been hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago. is still the same powerful word. Peter says in 1 Peter 1.25. But the word of the Lord endures forever. Everybody say forever. <laughs> but the word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. The same word, the same power, that word that is preached to us is the same word, amen, that will carry you through the storms of life. That will carry you and support you and strengthen you when you find yourself in a test 
or in a trial. It's the same word, amen, that Jesus spoke when he took the five loaves of bread and the two fishes. And the Bible says that he spoke to it. He blessed uh, those fishes and those loaves. Uh, and he was able to feed a multitude of over 5,000 people, amen. That same word that Jesus used to rebuke the, the demons uh, that were possessing the people that were possessed by those demons is the same word that we have today to stand upon. Amen. And to proclaim victory over the devil. Can I get an amen? So you see, Jesus that was born supernaturally 2,000 years ago in a manger. Amen. Still does the same miracles he did 2,000 years ago. That's the word that we preach. That's the word of the church. What is the mandate of the church? What is the foundation? What is the hope of the church? What is your hope as a believer in a Christian, an unbelieving world, in a world that's so messed up in darkness? It's the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. It's the word of God. Amen. The word that we have that we can stand upon and we can minister to the sick and we can minister to the hurting. Amen. That we can reach the lost for Jesus. It's the same word that we take out every Friday. We take it out to the streets. And I hope and pray that more and more of you would go out into the streets. Not only on Friday night, but whenever you get a chance, just remember that you have a word from God. And you have a word that is anointed and powerful, that is eternal. Amen. And the Bible teaches us that it will never fall to the ground in vain. Sometimes when we're trying to minister to a family member or we're trying to minister to our children. We're trying to minister to a friend. We may not see instant results. But we plant the seeds of God's word. And we know that eventually it will give forth fruit. Eventually we will see the results. It may not be instantly. But eventually we will see the results. Because the word of God is life. Isaiah 40. Verse 8 says, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Can I get an amen? Yeah. Psalm 119.89 says, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Now we know that our word, amen, can fail us. Amen? Yeah. We can say of our word that our word will never fade away. Because sometimes it does fail us. We often change our minds about things. As a matter of fact, you know, sometimes we tell people we're going to do something. And, and then three, four days later, we forget about it. And sometimes we even have to take our word back. And we say, well, I didn't really mean that. And that's because our word is not perfect. Our word is not perfect. Amen. But the word of God is perfect. When God says something... It'll come to pass. When, when you build your faith upon the eternal word of God, you can be sure that you are going to have consequences. You are going to have results because you're dealing with God's eternal word. See, and that is the most comforting and strengthening thing that a Christian can have. That's why John says in John 8, 32, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free, because it cannot fail. And this also means that everything that is written in his word taught you will come to pass as sure as you are alive. And I hope that we're catching this truth this morning in case there's any doubt about what, what God says about you. As a matter of fact, God says more good about you than what you say of yourself. His word speaks better things of you than what you speak of yourself. I've, you know, sometimes I have conversations with people and every other thing they talk about is how bad things are going with them. Oh, they will never be able to do this or do that. Not me. I don't deserve it. And they'll give you a million excuses. That's not what the word of God teaches me. One of the greatest promises we have around this ministry. And actually it's the foundation for the ministry that Carmen and I started. 
50 years ago when we opened up uh, the first home to take in young people from the streets that were addicted. You know, we, we didn't have uh, uh, doctors in our staff and we didn't have uh, medicine. You know, today they have clinics all over the United States, you know, uh, giving, telling drug addicts they're going to set them free from drugs by giving them other drugs. And they do that all the time. No, we had something. We had a promise. We had the word of the Lord. We had the word of God. And somebody may say, well, that's, you know, that, that's ignorant. No, it's not. Let me tell you what we did. We put up a sign. The first thing we did when we opened that ranch, we, we put up a sign. Our favorite scripture, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things are passed away. Behold, everything becomes new. And that's not just for drug addicts. It's for every one of us. Amen. The old life will pass away. Behold, everything becomes new. Because of the word of God. That's a promise that we have in God's word. God will turn the negative into positive. And he will bless those that will surrender to him. And that creative word works in our lives to bring out the best of us as we serve the Lord. And this is a promise for everybody. Everybody that comes to know the saving grace of Jesus Christ. And that's why I believe that, uh, you know, God speaks some more good about us than, than bad, the bad that we think about ourselves. There, there are Christians that think more worse things about themselves than what God says about them. And the good things that God says about them through his word. Malachi 3.6 says, For I am the Lord. For I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore you are not consumed. Notice that. Therefore you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. O sons of Israel. What is the Lord saying here to Israel? You may think bad about yourself, but I'm not thinking bad about you. You may think that you're only going to go so far in me, that you can only accomplish but so many things. You may think you are the worst in the land, but that's not what I think about you. I want you to know that in my sight and in my heart, you are not consumed, Jacob. You are a people of hope. Amen. If you're a child of God this morning and you love Jesus, hallelujah, God has a purpose for your life. He's got a plan for your life and he will never let you down. Listen, the reason why the world has not self-destruct up to now is because of God's mercy and God's compassion. But that's because it's the nature of God. Lamentation 322, Amplified Bible, listen to it. It is because of the Lord's loving kindness that we are not consumed. Because his tender compassions never fail. God could have done away with Israel a long time ago. He could have done away with this world a long time ago. But that's not God's plan. God's plan is that everybody comes to the saving power of Jesus Christ. Let me conclude with this. We find that his plan for us never changes. God's plan for your life will never change. The same plans that he had from the very beginning when you came to him. It's the same plan that will roll out through your life on this earth. Because God has an eternal wonderful plan for them that love him. 2 Peter 3, 8, 9 tells us this. But beloved, do not forget this one thing. That with the Lord one day is as a thousand years. And a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish. Notice, not willing that any should perish, but that all, everybody say all, all. that all should come to repentance. That's the plan of God. The plan of God for your life is not just that he came into your heart through his son Jesus 
But his plan is for you to finish your race. To finish your course. To live for God for the rest of your life until he calls us home. And let me tell you, God is more on your side than what you think. He is more for you than what you think. You know, I remember there was a time when I, I, would, I was a young Christian, but I, I listened to these preachers, you know, and, and things have changed a little bit, you know, but I, I just had a hard time with preachers that were always preaching a negative gospel. You know, a legalistic gospel. You know, the, 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 the don'ts of the Bible. The don'ts of the Bible. And I can remember, you know, it made you feel like God had a, a billy club, that he had a club, and he was looking over you. Every time you made a mistake, he popped you in your head. Amen. And that's the kind of God that some people paint. It's almost like some people desire for less people to make it to heaven than for more people to make it to heaven. But when I study the scriptures, I find that God wants the more than the less. That his plan and his purpose is that everybody would come to be saved. It doesn't mean that automatically everybody's going to be saved because we still have that sense of that commitment in that area of responsibility and decision. God will never invade that area. But when you are in Christ Jesus, you will make it to the end. And if you don't have Jesus in your life, the plan of God is for you to be saved. Amen. And for you to come to his saving power. 1 Timothy 2, 1, 4 says this. Therefore I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, notice, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Again, let's all say all. all. For all men. No exceptions. No exception for all men. The scriptures here exhorts us to pray, to intercede for every person that is in this world. Why? Because that's the will of God. Verse 2 says, For kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. So we are exhorted not only to pray for everybody. Why is that? Because God loves everybody. Why is that? Because God's plan is for everybody to be saved. Amen. Not just a few. Not just a, a special group that is going to be saved. But if, it, if it's up to the plan of God, this whole world can come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now we know that that's not true in every case. We know that. We know that it's going to be up to the individual. You know, there's an illustration that I'd like to think about sometimes and it has to do with Jesus knocking on the door of the sinner and if you ever seen that picture it's a picture where Jesus is in front of a door a beautiful door and he's knocking at the door but if you look carefully and very close you find that that door doesn't have a knob there's no knob there's no keyhole in that door so the guy that drew that picture and painted that picture knew exactly what Revelation chapter 3 is talking about. Behold, I knock at the door. And then Jesus says, if any man opens the door. Because you can only open the door of your life and your heart from the inside, not from the outside. And what is it saying? God will never force you to do anything you don't want to do. But if you do it, you will be blessed. If you do it, he will come into your life and he will invade your life and he will bless your life, amen. And he will give you life and life more abundantly. But it's up to you to open the door. So here the apostle exhorts us to pray for one another. Pray for every man to be saved. And then he goes on to say, pray for the kings and leaders of the world. Pray for the presidents. Right now, you know, America is in real bad shape. What do you think is going to change America? What do you think is going to change? What do you think? It, right now, the way things are going in, in America, all the lawlessness, all of the corruption, all of the sin that is in this world right now. Addiction rising. 
children dying on the street, people being raped on the street, being attacked on the street. It's almost like we're out of control. We are a divided country. And you think that a man is going to change this situation? You know, it's like uh, last night I was watching a documentary about Jerusalem. Uh, and I recommend for you to watch it. It's on Netflix, and it has to do with Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem, prophetically, and then the different gates of the city. And the second half speaks of the gates of the city, the gates by which you can only come in to the city because Jerusalem have always been surrounded by walls. Every conqueror, every king, every person in leadership did their own thing. And one of the gates is called the Golden Gate. And it's the only gate that is locked. It is closed with mortar, with concrete. Because one of the conquerors of one of the Arab countries, Muslims, uh, that didn't agree with the prophetic that is in the Bible, knew that there is a prophecy given that one day the Messiah will come to Jerusalem and he will walk in through the golden gate, through the golden door. So what he did was he blocked the door. It's a double door. He blocked it. And then on the other side, he built a cemetery because he knew that no priest will trample on a cemetery. But what he forgot is that, that a priest, a man, may feel that way, but the Messiah not only has the power to go through the door, but also go through the cemetery and raise up everybody from the dead. But the door can only be opened from the inside not the outside. You see, God's purpose and God's plan is to come in. And that's why we need to pray for America. We need to pray for our nation. We need to pray for our country. Amen. Regardless who's in the presidency. I can tell you, I don't agree with what's happening right now in this nation. All the stuff that is being allowed. I don't agree with a lot of that. And I, I do believe, listen... I, I'm not saying that we ought to pray for a president who's a Republican or a president who's a Democrat or whatever. We just need to pray for the man that's there that God will change his heart. Yeah. And that God will raise up God-fearing people. Teachers that love Jesus. Politicians that fear the Lord. Men of God, women of God that will fear God. Let me tell you, every conqueror that conquered Jerusalem never changed Jerusalem. They never could change that city. But there's only one, hallelujah. And he was born 2,000 years ago, hallelujah. He impacted Jerusalem then when he walked the streets. And there's coming a day, praise God, hallelujah. When he will also impact not only Jerusalem, but he will impact the whole world. And his name is Jesus. You want to know what Christmas is all about? It's all about the eternal Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, hallelujah, who was born in this world to take your sins and to take my sins. And also to see us through to the very end. So the Bible says, for this is good. Everybody say good. good. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Who desires, oh here comes the word. Who desires, everybody say desires. Who desires all men to be saved. Who desires for all men to be saved. And to come to the knowledge of the truth. You see here. God reminds his people. Just like he reminded Israel when they were in captivity for 70 years. The Bible says they were in captivity for seven, 70 years. They, a lot of them. Backslid. A lot of them forgot about the Lord. Just like today. We got a lot of backsliders. But there's hope. Because just because people backslide. It doesn't stop God from being God. It doesn't stop God from loving them. 
and wanting them to come back to him. And so Jeremiah tells us in Jeremiah 29, 10, 11, in connection to the 70 years, he says, For thus saith the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word taught you and cause you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Listen, I want you to know, God will never leave you in the dumps. God will never leave you on the ground. Amen. God will never desert you. No matter what, He loves you. Hallelujah. And if it's necessary, He will chase you down. I thank God He chased me down. When I had no correction, no possibility of being corrected. Incorrigible all the way. When everybody was saying the opposite. <laughs> Just like that old lady, my mother, chased me down. You're not getting away from me. And you're not getting away from God. Pray me down. Hallelujah. How many can relate to that? Amen. How many know we can pray people down? Amen. We can bring them in. We can bring them in. No matter what, we can bring them in. Because our God is a compassionate God. He's a God of mercy. He's the God of salvation. Oh, I wish to God that this Christmas we will lift our hands up to the heavens and we will celebrate our Lord Jesus Christ. Come on, lift your hands up this morning. Give Him the glory. Give Him the praise. He is worthy. He is worthy. Hallelujah. I want you to stand right now. Stand to your feet. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank God for His Word. Amen. I believe the Holy Spirit is in this place this morning in a very special way. And I want to pray for you this morning. I want to pray for every person this morning that is ready to open the door of your heart and allow the fullness of God to come in. Listen, I don't know where you are with God in your walk. But God doesn't want you halfway. He wants you to come in all the way. He wants you to surrender. Do you know that the greatest challenge that we have as men, as people, as women, as human beings, is to surrender, to give up, and surrender our lives 100% to our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only way that He can have His way in your life. Sometimes God goes so far and then He has to wait. He has to wait until you make a left or a right. Until you acknowledge that you need Him. He loves you. That's why He's there. But He's waiting on you. He's waiting on you to open the door and say, Come on in, Jesus. Have your way in my life. I don't know where you are spiritually with God, but I believe that God wants to bless you and he wants to take you on to another level and you walk with him but you got to let him come in 100% you got to let him in it's not enough to be coming to church church can't save nobody only the Lord Jesus Christ can save you only the Holy Spirit can touch your life only the Holy Spirit will teach you things that you never imagined that would be possible in your life and he wants to come in right now by your heads all over this house